everybody to Rock and Roll Confessional. We got Rita Wilde over there. I'm C.W. West. Talk to us, Rita. It's kind of a magical month. It's all about Tom in so many different ways, right? Tom Yeah, Penny? I don't know if we want to use the word magical or not, but, but it really is deserving a spotlight on Tom Petty because this is the month that he passed away right around this time and uh, also his birthday month. And so it's just a, a way of paying a tribute to Tom Petty, an artist that just means so much to so many people. And I think in some aspects, I think we kind of, I don't want to say took them for granted, but I mean, he was just, they were always there, you know, and now they're not, so. They always tour. It seems like they're always coming out with an album. They're always in the in the spotlight. Do you remember the first time you heard Tom? First time I heard Tom was, I wasn't even in radio. It was probably 76, 77, somewhere around there. I was listening to either KMET or K-West, and I heard uh, the song, and it was like, whoa, that's really good. And then I heard another one. And then it was like, okay, then I went out and bought the record because it was just that good. I remember hearing Tom up in San Francisco and it was one of the few places that he was being played. And so I went to the local music store, record store, which was called Record Factory back then. It was kind of like, I don't know, it was kind of the cooler place to hang out better than Warehouse. And um, and I went there and they didn't have it. And so luckily right next door was a used record store and there was a used I think like a promo copy, one copy sitting in there. And I grabbed it and took it home and just like played the whole thing over and over and over. Do you still have it? Because that's probably worth some bucks now, a promo copy. I think I probably did. He might have even signed it at one point in, oh. in my life oh. Wow, meeting Tom. Well, the uh, the gentleman we have on today is uh, somebody that we both know that we've worked with uh, in radio and so forth. Uh, I knew him basically as a uh, record representative. And, uh, you know, known him and some of the people that he worked with over the years. But just a genuine, down-to-earth, good guy. Uh, his name is John Scott. And you've worked with John Scott also on the I promotion did. side. Yeah, promotion sides. I worked with him for many years. And he had a, always had a great staff. And we don't really get into that time because we kind of stick with the Tom Petty subject here. But um, he did many amazing things after he was a record rep, after the kind of times you, you worked directly with him. Yeah, so just a great guy, and thanks to him, uh, we all get to hear uh, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. I mean, it's something that he heard and he fought for, much like uh, you know Tom Petty would fight for things in his career. John fought for things in uh, his record career as well, so we get to talk with him, and I hope you enjoy it. So here we go with our interview with the man who put Tom Petty on the map, John Scott. Hi, John. Hey, hey, buddy. How's it going? Long time no see. Yeah, I wish I had one of those fancy microphones like you. I'll send you one afterwards if you want. <laughs> it's because I'm recording the Zoom into a Zoom unit, trying to break up all the different tracks. But I think this is the, kind of the first time we've done it. And I think you and Rita are going to wind up in, on a single track, and then I'll be on a separate track. But we're making this up all as we go. It's sizzling. Memphis. That's, John Scott. that's actually what Tom wrote on my first album that he gave me. Where he came up with that, I don't know. Sizzling Memphis Natural John Scott. Love it. Makes all sense. Uh, we're that's with awesome. John Scott today, and John has had an illustrious career in all aspects of music, starting in radio and then record promotion. And actually, if it wasn't for John Scott, we would not know Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers because wow. his persistence. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your background, how you got started in the business down there in Memphis. Yeah, when I was 10 years old, you mean? Sure. Sure. Well, you know, my mom listened to radio a whole lot, and my dad did too, but my mom used to call in to a radio show and they, on Saturday mornings, and she would call in and request a song to be the DJ request, uh, say her name, and play the song she wanted. And so when she did that, and when the DJ did it, this huge smile on her face would light up. <clears throat> and I would do anything for him. My, my mom, I said, Mom, I'm going to be a DJ. And she said, all right. And so um, I knew I was going to be a DJ at 10 years old. After I graduated from high school, I wanted to go to radio school. And that was a great radio school. But um, my father wanted me to go to the University of Memphis. So uh, he insisted that I did. 
And after two years, I dropped out, which didn't make him very happy. And so he said, well, if you want to go to radio school in Memphis, which is the same place Johnny Cash went to. Is that right? Mm. A pretty famous radio school. And uh, I believe Wink Martindale went there, too. I don't know. But, but I, I, I did, and I, um took me about a year. And they helped me get a job, my first radio job, which was in Lawrenceburg, Tennessee. I had never heard of the city. 150 miles away, I, I rode on a Greyhound bus up there for the audition. And these guys liked me. There's like 5,000 people in the town that had an AM, FM. And I was to be the FM guy and just play. It was all middle of the road music. And bring you know, Herb, Herb Albert and Tijuana Brass. And I stayed there about a year. And I just was missing Memphis, and I just decided to quit. Something told me to quit and go home, and I did. And about five days later, there was a story in the newspaper about a new radio station turning to rock music. And it was an FM station, and they played pretty much middle-of-the-road music, but the general manager decided to he wanted to rock it. And when I saw the story, the next morning, I was at that radio station about 8 in the morning, waiting for program director to come in. And I just told him, I want that job. He said, okay, you've got the job. So the station I worked at was called FM 100, WMC FM 100. I remember the first night on the air, I was starting to get, to get calls from Georgia and Alabama, Kentucky, Arkansas. And I'm going, how do you guys, how are you hearing this? And they said, well, you're coming in loud and clear on the, on the, at FM 100. Next day, I find out we have 400,000 watts of power. Wow. 400,000 watts of power. Right. I've and never heard of that. No, it's probably the, the most powerful FM station in America. I think there's one 500,000 watts, but they don't play rock. Wow. So I guess two years into it, we started to play everything we wanted to play. We, our goal was to play the song before anybody else would play it. We started playing with Purple Harems and just the great songs of the day. And promotion guys started hanging around our station because we were we were one of the first stations ever played David Bowie. Wow. And he his second gig in America was in Memphis and I did a two hour interview with him on the phone. Now he's never done an interview on the phone, but and so the promo guys started hanging around our station knowing that we could break a record. We could play a record, it would sell. So they started hanging around, which was great. I love these promo guys. They knew we were pretty powerful force and we could play what we wanted to play. Found out that promo men made more money than a DJ and they had an expense account. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Back then and they then, did. But anyway, um, I started thinking about it and I thought, well, you know, I'm turning music, new music on to listeners and a promo guy turns radio stations on to music. It's kind of the same thing, but they're working, making more, way more money than I am. So. Um, one time a guy from MCA came in and said, I'd like to hire you. You seem to have a pretty good ear for music. And I really hated leaving radio. You guys know that. I mean, it's like, it's like your baby. Right. Yeah. So I took the job as local promotion man at MCA Records. What was your position there? I mean, what did you have to do? Well, I had, I had like three, ter- three cities I had to go to. Of course, Memphis, Nashville, and Little Rock to get records played on the radio. And... Yeah. The first week I was there, uh, they sent, for some reason they sent Olivia and John into Memphis. I picked her up at the airport, took her to the hotel, and we were promoting her new album. And she said, you know, it's 106 degrees in Memphis. She said, do you mind if I come out for, uh, and if I go take a swim? I went, no, I'm not sure. Go ahead. I'll just sit here and read the magazines. Or something. And she comes out in a smoking hot bikini. I mean, mind-boggling Australian kind of bikini. And I went, I'm kind of like this job. I have a feeling. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we drove to Nashville to see Scott Shannon at WMAK in Nashville. We took him to dinner and we got in the car after dinner and Olivia said, why don't you put this, put, put the new single in, the cassette player, play Scott, the, our song. So I popped it in and I started playing and she said, John, you're playing the wrong song. I went, oh, God, I'm sorry. Scott, I'm playing the wrong song. He said, no, don't stop. I want to hear this song. And he said, that's the number one hit record. She said, but it's the wrong single. And he said, I don't care. And he, anyway, he went inside. It was 11 at night. He put it on the radio for us to hear in the car. And it was I Honestly Love You. 
Wow. I played the wrong song. So I called my boss the next day and I said, hey, um, I got my first ad, but it's the wrong song. And he said, well, tell Scott Shannon to take it off. And so I called Scott and he said, well, you tell him to go after himself because it's my number one request in record right now after three days. Wow. On the way up there, MCA provided me with a cassette of all the new releases that were coming out, you know, in the next month or so. And so Olivia and I are sitting there listening to this cassette and we would go, oh, that's pretty good. Oh, that's not very good. And then a song called, uh, came on, it's got, had a little reggae beat and it was called Depot Street. And it was by a band called Mud Crunch. And we both said, hey, that's a pretty cool song. But she said, the name is kind of stupid, Mud Crunch. However, after she left the next day, I took it over to WKDF in Nashville, to the FM station there. And they said, hey, we like this record. We're going to add it to a playlist. So I called my boss again. And I go, my first ad, <laughs> Mud Crunch, Depot Street. I'm not happy, you know. He said, John, it's a single. There's no album. We're not really concentrating on mud crunch, okay? So Nobody cares. Go work for Olivia Newton John's right. So I did. I forgot mud crunch. I never knew who they were. I never knew who the singer was. I never I did I, I not so anyway, that, that's kind of circles back to another story in my book. Then I was promoted to regional promotion in Atlanta, and so I pretty much covered the whole south. And I did pretty good. I became real good friends with Leonard Skinner right when they were first starting out. And um, they really liked me. We had a great time. Yeah, that was kind of a crazy time, you know. Yeah. Well, part of your job was going on the road with these guys. I mean, sometimes a band would come into town and you'd have to shuffle them around station to station for interviews. But sometimes you were literally, you were on tour with them, correct? Correct. Usually for two weeks at a time. And at the time, Leonard Skinner was managed by a guy named Peter Rudge. And he also managed The Who. <laughs> <laughs> My job was to go on the road for two weeks at a time. Two weeks with The Who, take a week off, and two weeks with Leonard Skinner. Oh, Possibly imagine what was that like. Who was crazier? You knew The Who and Keith Moon. I've never seen anything like it in my life. One of the craziest, I mean, he's a great drummer. Frankly. He's one of the craziest men I've ever known in my life. And he taught Joe Walsh a thing or two. <laughs> he did, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that was part of my job. But when I was in Atlanta, they, I was doing pretty good. And we, they moved me to Los Angeles to be head of album promotion in Los Angeles. And I'm, you know, I'm a kid from Memphis. <clears throat> and all of a sudden, I'm working in the back lot studios of Universal Pictures, where the MCA office was. And um, it was like it couldn't be any better. I'm like working with Leonard Skinner, Elton John, The Who, Golden Earring, Wishbone Ash, you know. That's when the fun began because I was just in heaven in Los Angeles. And uh, I never, actually, I'd never been to Los Angeles. Wow. And then uh, it was going great. I was there like two years, had a album promotion and flying around all these groups. And then all of a sudden, we were, they gave me a record by a kid named Johnny Cougar. And uh, we were in a meeting with all the salespeople and promotion people and the president. And the president said at the end of the meeting, does anyone listen to this Johnny Cougar record? And I held my hand up. I said, I said, yeah, I kind of like that song, Johnny Cougar. He said, which one? And I said, Chestnut Street Revisited. So he grabs it, puts it on the turntable, and after about 30 seconds, he takes it and throws it in the trash can. And he said, who the hell would play a song by John, a kid named Johnny Cooper? And that music is awful. And his stupid manager, Tony DeFreeze, probably put the name Johnny Cooper on him. And when I heard the name Tony DeFreeze, he was David Bowie's first manager. Oh. David Boyd just fired Tony DeFreeze as his manager. So Johnny Cougar was Tony DeFreeze's next Midwest superstar. So when I heard the name Tony DeFreeze, I was really excited because I knew Tony DeFreeze was a class guy. I don't know if he was a class guy or not, but he was a pretty smart guy. And he guided David Boyd's career in the very beginning. So the A&R guy came out after the meeting and said, you really like this guy because I signed him. And, but they hate the music here. And he said, yeah, you, but nobody's ever seen him. So they send me to Seymour, Indiana to see this kid named Johnny Cougar. It's a really small town. I went to the armory to see him that night, and they sat me in the first row. And I thought nobody really knew I was there, to be honest with you. And, and I'm walking down the aisle, like I hear people go, hey, there's that MCA guy. 
I'm sitting in the front row, and he looked, and he comes out and does an acoustic version of Chestnut Street Revisited, just staring at me like, what do you think now, Mr. MCA guy? <laughs> and then his band comes out and just kicks ass, and I'm going, oh, God, this kid is a superstar. And I went back to my room, called my boss back there, and said, look, don't drop this kid. He's a superstar. And I go, and I think he went, what are you smoking, John? And so he said, you know what, it's late, call me, we'll see, see you Monday. So I just went back to LA and tried to do anything I could to get Johnny Cougar played. I rented a live Cougar from, you had to call up, uh, <laughs> you had to call up, uh, was there a rent a cougar service? <laughs> well, if you worked at MCA, because it means something different nowadays. <laughs> if you worked at MCA, you had to go through central casting, right? And I mean, there was a casting for painters and for truckers, and obviously for cougars. I don't know. <laughs> and so the lady thought I was kidding, and and so I had to go get my boss, and he said, "Yeah, we we want to get a cougar. How much is it? Five thousand dollars a day." And they were going, "Holy crap, John, you're out of your mind." We get out the next morning and there's a cougar in a van, I mean in a truck, in a cage, and we drove to KMET and tried to talk Sam Bellamy to come out to the to the uh, outside to meet our new artist Johnny Cougar. <laughs> he said, "Okay, can I bring a few more DJs?" I think Jim Lab was there. And I, so they walked outside and saw this cougar. She's got she went, "No freaking way, I'm not taking a picture with a cougar." Well, <laughs> it, it, he's been declawed. He's been in Tarzan movies. And just make a pretty cool picture. And he just ate. <laughs> so we started walking gingerly towards the cougar. The cougar started growling. <laughs> Sam going, Sam's going like, uh, I, I, I don't know, John. I, I don't know if we can do this. Finally, she said, okay. So we took a picture of the whole KMT staff with a cougar. And we also went to Tower Records. And we didn't really tell them we were coming. So we set up the cougar in the parking lot of Tower God. Records. <laughs> and, uh, you promotion guys. Asked the guy, the manager of Tower Records, to come outside and have a picture with our artist Johnny Cougar. So he came out, and then there were 300 people standing behind us, and like Cougars growling. <laughs> and I, you know, in my mind, I'm going MCA rep fired for <laughs> eaten <laughs> Cougar killing 200 people. I don't know. <laughs> but that was the day, you know, Rita. You, you know. People did crazy stuff. I mean, we did anything we could to get records played. You didn't have to, you know, answer to legal and get it approved by so and so and get it approved by so and so up the chain. It was spontaneous and yes. it, there was a certain excitement to it. I mean, as a listener of radio in those days, when that shit was going on, it was like, oh my God, I can't believe it. You know, it's like, you know, that's, that's one of the main things that influenced me about music and radio and, and, yeah. and cougars. <laughs> <laughs> when the lawyers get too involved, it just, it smashes it all up. We never really got involved. I don't know why. I mean, I, I couldn't believe it, but I kept going and going, and they finally said, stop working Johnny Cougar, John. I can't stop. And they said, yeah, you can. I said, no, I can't. And they said, yes, you can. You're fired. <sighs> and they fired me at 10 o'clock in the morning because I like Johnny Cougar. But, um, you know, I go home and I don't have a job. I just bought a house in Woodland Hills. And, but anyway, so I'm sitting there and Charlie Miner, VP of promotion at ABC Records, he called me and said, you know, why would you stick up for Johnny Cougar? I think he's a superstar. That's why. All of a sudden he said, would you come to ABC and be the head of the album promotion at ABC? And of course I went, hell yeah, I have a job. I didn't even ask him how much money I was making. And so I go to work there on Monday morning. And he took me to my office and, and he tells me, you're gonna, this is gonna be a great home for you, John, but you gotta do me one favor, raise your right hand. I will never do another Johnny Cougar stunt again. <laughs> Meaning, John, if we don't believe in an artist, don't get involved, cause you'll get fired. So I raised my right hand, I think I had my fingers crossed behind my back because, you know, Rita, you know, I, I would go to the wall for any band that, that you believed in. That I yeah. believed in. And yeah. So three days later, I'm getting a clo- I go to my closet to get my jacket out, and this white album kind of tumbled out. It was nothing on the album cover. Uh, there was I opened and pulled the vinyl out. There was nothing on that, and I kind of wondered who, who is this. And something told me to just sit down and put it on. So I put it on. I hear a song called "Rocking Around with You." I'm going, "Yeah, pretty cool song." 
Then I hear a song I assume is called Breakdown. And man, every hair on my body stood up as goosebumps. And I don't even know who I'm listening to. And I listened to every song, and the album ends with American Girl, and I literally was like in a trance. I mean, seriously, going, God Almighty, this is good. And I listened to it twice. I put my headphones on the second time, and it, it was even better in headphones. So I, I, I ran to Charlie's office and went, who are these guys? With the white album jacket, he takes the vinyl out, puts it on the turntable. He went, play, he went, played it for about ten seconds. He goes, "Oh, that's that punk band, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers." And I'm kind of going, "What do you mean a punk band?" Yeah. He said, "John, that's what radio's told us. Um, look at this cover of this guy. He pulls down the real cover, and it's a picture of Tom with black leather jacket on, bullets around his neck, long stringy blonde hair, and a smirk on his face. And he said, radio stations have told us it's a punk band." There's no future, and we're dropping it from the label. And here I am, going, oh my God, <laughs> oh my God, you got to be wearing. Charlie, have you ever listened to this record? And he went, yeah, not really, because he was promoting. He was a top forty guy. He was promoting Billy Davis and Marilyn McCoo records, and told the promotion people, "Don't work Tom Petty." And ABC, they didn't have a lot of rock music on their roster, did they? Well, they had Steely Dan, they right. had Jimmy Buffett. Um, Stephen Bishop, who has songs on and on, right? Um, no, no, they didn't really have a lot. A lot of, a lot of R and B, a lot of jazz. So I, I said, Charlie, you can't drop this band. And he said, John, you know, you're gonna get fired if you keep going. And I said, Charlie, just give me six weeks to try and get this record played. That's all I'm asking. And finally, he said, he said no. And I really got, I got him down on my knees and I begged him. Give me six weeks. That's all I want. I said, Charlie, if nothing happens after six weeks, I swear to you, I will stop. And uh, finally, he said, all right, I'll give you six weeks. You can't buy any ads. You can't buy any radio station spots. Nothing. Zero. We spent too much money on this band. And they've only sold 12,000 copies. A few stations were playing it in San Francisco and Boston. And it had been out, like, for eight months. It had, right. it had been, I thought yeah. it had been out for eight months. So he goes, if you can get this unbankable punk band, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, I'll kiss your ass in the Sunset Strip. And, and I'd like to flew over my head because I had just heard something I knew was a game changer. Yeah. Like, there was no music being made like what I heard on that first record of Tom Petty's Breakdown, yeah. American Girl, Luna. Rockin' Around With You. Rockin' Around With You, that was the first yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. Just a great record. And, I mean, I, you know, I, I love you because you, you're honest. You've always had that dignity about you. But, you know, in, in reading your book, Tom Petty and Me, I mean, I really learned about your integrity. And that is a hard thing to do, what you did, buddy. You know, you just lost a job. You went to the walls for John Cougar. You know, later they realized, okay, it's, you know, John Mellencamp. And, you know, he had such an amazing career. And here they were just ready to throw away this great album. You know, eight months out and nobody, no real promotion, nobody really knew about it. So no. kudos to you on that. Thank you very much, Rita. And, you know, I, I, same with you, you know. You, you were so great to work with at KLOS and, and you would listen to people. And, uh, and I, you know, most of the guys back then were, I mean, there were some that were different, but we really would never play you a bad record if we thought it was a bad record. There were times when, uh, you know, they would come in and say, this is the lead single, and, and we go, no, I mean, you know, I'd bring CW in from promotions and other people and say, this is not your lead single. You know, <laughs> this you can't go with this song. It's just, it's, you know, oh, but it's our third single. I go, no, no, no. Nobody knows this band. You've got to come out smoking, you know, with this. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, that's that's something when you put your integrity on the line, when you put your job on the line, when you believe something so much and thank God that you did that uh, I, I loved some of the promotion stuff, how you got that all going and, and some of the early believers in uh, Southern California uh, KMT was not among them KLOS was not among them KMT said, it's a, Sam Bellamy said it's a punk record we're not playing it and thank God uh, a good friend of mine and probably yours, Charlie Kendall came into town to start yeah. K-West yeah, yep compete with you guys, but he didn't have a very good signal. But he was a good friend of mine. And I took the record over to his apartment, and he sat and listened on headphones. 
And he looked at me with this stone glaze, like, who the hell are these guys? This is one of the best records I've ever heard. Mm-hmm. And, you know, for me, it's like, thank God, somebody yeah. hears what I hear. So he said, are they in a good live? And I went, I don't know. I've, I've never, I just picked up the record three days, three days ago by accident. But they're playing the, at the Whiskey this Saturday night, opening for Blondie. And he said, hell yeah, we're going. Wow. Like, hell yeah, we're going. We wanted to see this band. And so um, we went to the Whiskey Saturday night. I believe it was August 16th. I almost remember the day. And we sat down. And maybe there was 20 people in the Whiskey at that time. And this time was the opening band at 7 o'clock. And I'm going to myself, please, God, don't be a punk band. <laughs> don't look like punks. You know, and Charlie and I both knew we heard something. So they come out, and they're all looking pretty cool. I mean, Tom's got a scarf on, and Stan's mm. cool, the drummer, Ben is mind-blowing. And they open up with a with Chuck Berry song called Carol, or Carol. And Charlie and I looked at each other and went, God almighty, a guitar player is one of the best I've ever seen in my life, Mike Campbell. So he played about a 35-minute set. And he played, when he played Breakdown, Charlie leaned over and said, I'm going to it's a hit record, John. I'm going to start playing that record on Monday morning, once an hour, every hour. And for, That's a lot. For a promo yeah. guy, you're like, God, I'm going to add my back pocket. So I, that's when I decided after the show was over, they got no encore because there weren't many people there. Nobody knew who Tom Petty and Heartbreakers were. And I just went upstairs with Charlie and I'm looking for this guy, Tom Petty, because I wanted to tell him what was going to happen on Monday morning. And I, I see him. He's wiping sweat off his face. And I go, hey, Tom, I'm John Scott, the new head of album promotion for ABC Records. And he looked at me and said, I don't give a fuck who you are. We it's that punk attitude. <laughs> we hate ABC Records. They've ruined our career. They've advertised us in teen magazines, punk magazines. We're not a punk band. We're a rock and roll band. I said, and, and I really love you guys. I don't know anything about the history of what happened with it, ABC in the past, but I love you guys. I'm saying these things. Out, like, I don't even know why I'm saying these things. I went, you ever heard your record on the radio in Los Angeles? Well, I knew I was saying that because nobody ever played it. Tom goes, no, I've never heard my record played on the radio. Why? I said, well, you got to hear it Monday morning, once an hour, every hour. And she said, oh, shit. This is, you know, this is the same stuff I hear from ABC Records for the last eight months. Somebody says, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. And it turns out you guys are just a bunch of nut jobs. And I, I, I didn't expect to hear what he he said, it, and then he hollered up to Stan Lynch. You guys can have this stuff out, right? Do we need to? If you want, no, if you want the truth. Oh, yeah. Um, so at that time, he yells up to Stan Lynch, Hey, Stan, tell this guy what ABC Records stands for. Do you know? I went, no, I don't know. I've only been there three days. <laughs> ABC stands for a bunch of cocksuckers. <laughs> <laughs> no resentment. Oh, boy. Yeah. We're going to take a quick break from our interview with the man that put Tom Petty on the map, John Scott, from his book, Tom Petty and Me. So first off, we want to thank everybody for taking the time to write reviews. We always appreciate it, and I know every week we ask for it. Whatever platform you listen to the show on, whether it's Amazon Music or Spotify or iTunes, if you just take a couple minutes, it really will only take a couple minutes, just rate us and write a nice review. We'd appreciate it. This latest review is by Livy Gal. And she says, I listened to the podcast while I'm working at home, and today was the first time I posted a recommendation on Facebook for my friends. Conversations are truly confessional. Thanks to the engaging Rita Wilde and C.W. West master interviewers. That's us, Rita. Master interviewer. I'm hooked on it, listening to all the episodes, and will listen every week. Thank you, Libby Gal. Thank you, Libby Gal. And by the way, we're every two weeks, so that way you don't think you're missing one every other week. (laughs) Also, big distant hugs to all of our Patreon supporters. One of the perks of being a Patreon supporter is that we offer the opportunity for you to submit questions to some of our guests. Okay, look, there may be no trick-or-treating this year. What? So, I know. So the least we can ask you for is maybe to send a little treat our way. That's right. As little as a buck a month helps us keep going. Please go to the support tab on our website, rockandrollconfessional.rocks. Or directly to Patreon to make a small pledge. We are so grateful for all of you that have already supported us. And we appreciate anybody else that jumps on board. All right, Reitz. So in in keeping with the theme, got a good Tom Petty question for us this time? Sure. Let's try it. 
Which Tom Petty song from Let Me Up, I Have Had Enough was co-written by Bob Dylan? Hmm. Did you know this or do you have to look it up? I know everything. You don't know everything. <laughs> you don't know everything. <laughs> I know right. nothing. I know nothing. Rita will give you the answer at the uh, next break. So we left off with John telling a story about meeting Tom Petty backstage at the Roxy Theater in Los Angeles, and it wasn't going well. But you'll hear how the whole story turns out for the better in the second half. So now let's get back to our interview with John Scott. Tell this guy what ABC Records stands for. Do you know? I went, no, I don't know. I've only been there three days. <laughs> ABC stands for a bunch of cocksuckers. <laughs> No resentment. Oh, boy. Yeah. And he tells the roadie to escort us to Nutjob out. And then I turned around and said, Tom, I'm going to break your career wide open, okay? And then another expert, he flew out of his mouth. And I didn't know that I could, but I really did. And then as I'm walking towards the door, for some crazy reason, I just turned around and said, Tom Petty, my name is John Scott. When you hear your record on the radio, you're never going to forget me. Don't you ever forget my name, okay? Of course, there were flying expletives <laughs> everywhere. People were laughing. And, you know, these were all nut jobs. And anyway, so Charlie and I went out, and we started laughing because we knew he had no idea what was about to happen. We played Breakdown once an hour. And so Wednesday, Charlie got a call from Tower Records going, who is this guy you're playing? And uh, he said, we got people calling. So they ordered 250 copies of an eight-month-old record. And the sales manager came in and said, what the hell's going on? I said, well, we're going we're going." Make this band a number one priority. He said, John, it's eight months old. I kept hearing eight months old. Yeah, oh. yeah. It's not even born yet. <laughs> Nine months gestation. It's just right. percolating. There's rarely a few records that have been out for eight months that kind of resurface. It, it doesn't happen. It doesn't really happen. Tom's manager called me on Wednesday morning before the Power Records thing and said, Who are you? You've you really pissed off my artist. I went, What do you mean? He said, We told him we were going to break his career. I said, well, I am. And he said, don't say things that you can't do. And hung up. And on Friday, my assistant came in and said, hey, Tom Petty's on the phone. And I'm kind of going, oh, God. This could go if you here we go. here. I don't, I don't know what he's going to say to me now. <laughs> I'll pick up the phone. And he said, John, he's got a southern drawl, of course, he's from Florida. And he said, John, um, my friends have been telling me they're hearing the record on the radio, like you said. Are you serious about what you said? I said, Tom, I'm going to break your career wide right open. He said, would you come over to my house? I want to meet you again. <laughs> <laughs> the, the first time yeah. was not a good impression. <laughs> I was a little, crank, <laughs> little cranky that time. And so I go to his house. And I see a Confederate flag right away. I know I'm from Tennessee. He's from Florida. I'm going right away. We're on the same wavelength here. You know, it's kind of a different conversation. But we went outside, and I'm telling Tom about my career. Radio and working with the Who and all this stuff. I didn't mention Johnny Cougar because I thought he was, he was I think I was a nut. And I said, well, have you been in any other bands that I might know? He said, yeah, but you've never heard of them. One called Mud Crutch. <laughs> uh, wait a minute. Depot Street? So he looks at me, how the hell do you know Depot Street? And at that point, we just kind of stopped and stared at each other like, what the hell is going on? Yeah. You just told me you're going to break my career, and you know Mud Crutch? And we really didn't say anything for like 30 seconds. It was one of those things that was like, I can't even describe what it was like, because what are the odds of me knowing Depot Street since 1974? Yeah. Zero. Pretty much yeah. zero chance, and here I come out with Depot yeah. Street out the top of my head. He said, I want to play some new stuff, and I said, okay, great. We're, well, these are demos. We've been working on them, but we don't know if they're coming out because ABC's going to drop us. And he plays me Listen to Her Heart. Mm. And that opening lick from Mike Campbell, <clears throat> Listen to Her Heart, immediately grabs you. And um, I, I, I came out of my skin when I heard that record. We bonded that night. I mean, seriously bonded. And we walked out. He walked me out to my car. And I said, hey, I just want to repeat what I said the other night. Don't ever forget my name. And he kind of looked at me with a wry smile. like, okay, sure, okay. And all of a sudden... I, I'm getting on the phone and I'm calling radio stations that never played it. And they said, hey, is that, is that the eight-month-old records? I'm like, yeah, they are they're a punk band. And I started getting a little, like, depressed. But all of a sudden, certain stations said, well, let me listen again. 
we sent out a hundred copies of the album, and I put a sticker on the album. Don't look, don't, don't look at the cover. Just play the fucking record. And all of a sudden, people started playing Breakdown. Wow. And it was like, I knew I was onto something at that point. But there were 90 FM stations that weren't playing it. And that was Lee Abrams, who was the consultant. Yeah. And the CW. And they were basically in, kind of in charge of telling the program directors at all the stations that they worked with what to play yeah. because they knew better than the actual program or music directors, correct? Exactly. And most stations that were in second place hired these guys. And mm-hmm. at that point, if you remember, Rita, it was like kind of like everybody's kind of pissed off. At oh, yeah. You couldn't tell. You couldn't play what you wanted to play if you were a Lee Abrams consultant. Yeah. My mission was to go on a city tour of every station that wasn't playing Tom Petty. Stopped in Dallas, and the morning guy was the PD, and he said, sit in my office, and uh, I sat and was reading magazines. And the, and the week before, Tom Petty's first album hit the charts at 177. And I opened up that billboard just to, I wanted to revel in the moment of seeing 177. And... I looked at it in this big circle around it said, don't play this record. It's a John Scott hype. Mm. And I about came out of my skin and, and <clears throat> the program director came in and said, John, that's, that's, that's our uh, consultant saying that. It wasn't me. I swear uh, to you. Um, where, where's Lee Abrams? He's in Atlanta. So I flew right to Atlanta and confronted him. And he said, well, you know, I, I, I did give two stations the authority to play it. One in Atlanta, one in Chicago, which is Sky Daniels. And they've been telling me they've been getting a little reaction to it. So let me think about Tom Petty and Hartberg a little bit in the whole breakfast in the morning. That's when he came out and said, hey, can we do, I've got an idea, let's do a frequency tour of the Lodo concerts. And so I had to convince ABC Records that, because Lee said, if you'll do this, I'll add the record to 90 stations. So ABC agreed to finance the tour, got us a tour bus, and we went and played about 20 stations for dollar three, dollar two, dollar mm-hmm. one. We knew that if we got the DJs into that venue, they'd come out believers, and that's exactly what happened. I mean, you know, Rita, and you see, you go see Tom Petty, it's a mind blowing experience. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Why don't you give us the highlights of, of some of the promotions and stuff that you did with Tom? Because I know there was something at Tom's house, and there was even something at your house. Um, just give us those quick rundowns of yeah, just sure. some of the big stuff you did. Well, uh, before Southern Accents came out, the, there was the Radio Records Convention, and coming in, I thought, well, you know, Tom was by this time, you know, a pretty known rock and roll star. And I said, let's get... 50 programmers go over to, to come to a listening of Southern Accents. And he's, the manager both said, okay. And I said, well, what if we do it at your house, Tom? And he went, okay. And so, but you got to bust everybody up from Ventura Boulevard to his house in Encino. And so 50 people, top level people, program directors, music directors, came to Tom's house and he was standing there with a glass of champagne to hand everybody, introduce himself. And sat us down and told us a little bit about the concept of the album. And um, MCA paid for all the party favors. And uh, MCA going back to them now again because ABC Records kind of folded, and so they became MCA. They were bought right? by MCA, right? Yeah, they were bought by MCA, and, and I didn't. I knew if I went back to them, they'd just fire me again. But um, so they had me working. Uh, Tom insisted that I be uh, a part of every record as a. As a independent promotion person. And so um, we sat and listened to that album and after Rebel was played, mm. I mean, there's some, there some rednecks in the crowd that just jumped up and went, yeah, <laughs> And so people just, I mean, after the record's over, they turned around to him. He was standing behind everybody and they gave me five minutes standing ovation. Wow. It was like one of the greatest moments in my life because mm. I, I don't think of too many artists now that it's kind of come over to my house and right. listen to my album inside my house. And smoke a little something with them, right? And yeah, maybe rumors are. <laughs> I don't know. Tom, no, but Tom was known <laughs> for sometimes smoking a little doobie. You no, know, it was the seventies, and that's what we did. I mean, you know, it was just one of those things, and we made no bones about it. Yeah, joints were being passed yeah. around. Yes, I. Will. One thing that I think you guys really had in common is that 
Tom was also a type of person with that integrity of I'm going to fight for what's right. I'm going to do what's right. And so he did that a lot with his music, getting back to his publishing. Uh, you know, he had the second album, which was a huge monster hit. And then the fourth album, it was like, okay, let's put the record price on the record store and just kind of shove it to him one more time because they were going to charge an extra dollar for it. And he said, no, my fans don't need that. You know, just yeah. put it out at the, reg- re- the regular price. You know, he was always that kind of, that kind of a person. Yeah, you know? yeah, he never wanted to use his music in a commercial ever. He didn't want that. And when they said, uh, you, you're, we're going to jack the album price up to nine ninety eight instead of eight ninety eight on your record, he didn't want to be the guinea pig. Yeah. <clears throat> and so he fought him. And that went on. That became a, lo- uh, became a lawsuit, I think. Yeah. He finally won, but he never backed down. He, uh, yeah. you're right. He just, he just didn't back down to anybody if he felt something was wrong. And he, in his life, he had a terrible deal with Shelter Records. And, um, you know, that, they fixed that. And then, um, once you get over to MCA Records, he was signed to a label by uh, Backstreet Records, which was run by Danny Bramson, the Universal Tour Booker. But, uh, no, and Tom, and, and he turned around and gave, and he, gave he owed three million dollars to MCA. And they filed for bankruptcy. And so, Danny Bramson made, made it all work out to where Tom owed nothing. And I don't know if I won't back down came out of that experience, but yeah, you're right. He just, he was, he was a great guy, genius songwriter. Yeah. Just a down to earth person. And he, he just said, nobody's going to do things like that to me too. My fans won't, won't, won't get it. Why is Tom Petty doing it? Yeah. yeah. He's an album. But he did that all of his life. And, um, I respected the hell out of it. Yeah. And, it's just like on the tour bus in the very beginning. There's no girls allowed on this bus. It's just us. And, you know, I've been on many, many tours where that's not the case. Yeah. Maybe with the who. <laughs> but <laughs> he just stood up for what he believed in. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing with his songwriting. You know, I look back on it now and I, I just go, I didn't take him for granted because I was a big fan. I loved their music, saw them several times. Mm-hmm. Like, like even with the last shows, you know, the 40th anniversary, and said, oh, you know, I've got to work the weekend, la, la, la. Right. And, you know, I'll catch them the next time because I just saw them at the Fonda Theater. Right. And, and and then the news happened, and it's just like, tell me if I'm crazy on this, John, because this was the same time that there was that uh, big shooting in Las Vegas. There were people, uh, concert goers to the, the country fest there, and, you know, Las Vegas, anybody could have been playing that day. Sure. And and there's a part of me that thinks Tom Petty saw that and just went, what the fuck? You know, and just it, it really brought him down. I, that's what, you know, my thinking is, is that, you know, he, it's just like he couldn't believe it. And then then he, then we couldn't believe that, that he was going. He physicalized I mean, it. Yeah. Yeah, that was, that was quite a day. The week before... Um, you know, I played three nights at the Hollywood Bowl. And I didn't go Friday or Saturday night because I wanted to see the last show because there was rumors that he wasn't going to tour anymore, maybe do a Wildflowers tour, scale down. But I said, you know, I want to be at the last show of this tour. I think it was 52 cities. And uh, I did an interview on Sirius Radio. And, and uh, he was driving from Malibu to the Hollywood Bowl, and his wife told me after few days later that he had heard that interview and said to Dana, he said, John, everything John just said was 100% right. And I didn't know that time because I just went to my seats. I didn't go backstage. I just didn't want to be a part of the scene back there. And I'm sitting there and my daughter, fourth song, and she stops the show and tells the audience of 18,000 people what I did and played I won't back down. And I look at that now as a gift that he left me. Oh, God, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I didn't know it was coming, that he was going to get up and dedicate a song to me. And then, um, you know, he's the kind of guy who takes off first. He wants to be out of the venue. He doesn't want to be at the party because he's a very shy guy. Mm -hmm. And he also thinks that he takes away from the other band members when it's him and all the other band members. Everybody wants to get off at his autograph. So he's in the car in the limo 
probably home by the computers clapping for a third encore. <laughs> but um, yeah, that was an incredible night. It was like <laughs> surreal. At a week later, he was gone. Yeah. Now he had been having some some health issues. From what I understand, he had like actually cracked a hip, and people were saying, "You got to get off the road. You got to, you know, you got to take care of that." And he was just like, "I got to go on with the show. Got to go on with the show." That was Tom. He did not want to disappoint his fans. <laughs> and you know, I saw him in Memphis on May seventeenth for that for that tour, and I went backstage and we took a picture. And I said, "Tom, how you doing?" He said, "Well, I got a few aches and pains, and I can't hear out of my left ear." And uh, he had some kind of a plug in his ear. And he said, but it's nothing that's going to stop the show. So I didn't really think anything about that. I mean, I went to my seats and I kind of saw Steve Peroni having his back kind of pushing him up the stairs. I mm. thought, well, that's kind of strange, but we really put too much into it. And I never really heard about the cracked hip, to be quite honest with you. Never. And, uh, you know, if he was on medication uh, that powerful, he never showed it in a concert that I saw yeah. him do it. Never. And he came out, of course, he had a cracked hip. And the day of the day he died, he was told it was a broken hip. You know, maybe wow. I would have gone right to the doctor and said, hey, fix this cracked hip. Yeah. But Tom just wanted to be home. His grandkid was there, been on the road for, I don't know, so he said 52 shows. And, you know, I don't know the reason. I, I'm kind of a guy who, I'm feeling something, I go to the doctor. But I think Tom was just worn out and wanted to be at home. Yeah. Looking back, of course. He should have gone to the doctor. You had the, uh, the chance to tell him that you were writing a book. I did. And, and, and that was in Memphis. And he, he told me, just just tell it like it was, John. Whatever you want to say, just tell it like it was. And, uh, I, and, and but in my book, I think I did. I think I told it exactly the way it happened. You know, like I said, it was a pretty weird thing that how this all came about, me meeting him. And people ask me, what would have happened if you hadn't picked up that record? And, I said, and how many people would have taken a, a, a white label record and put it on a turntable? You no, know, something told me to do it. A higher power told me to put, sit down. Yeah. And record. Yeah. I was going to lunch. People ask me, what, 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 what do you think would have happened? And I, the answer is, I don't know. I mean, he could have been signed by another label, of course. He could have broken up the dance and how I'm moving back to Gainesville. Any number of things could have happened. But I like to think that it was meant to happen. Yeah. Um, with me and him and everything else that he did in his life to be true, never selling out. That meant a world to me. Uh, and, and just what an incredible songwriter and, and Mike Campbell, the whole band. I mean, just great musicians and so many times they don't get enough credit and Tom Petty doesn't, I don't think, get enough credit for just being being able to write a pop song under three minutes I mean, it's like his first record. I mean, it was like all, it's like that's, that's top 40 territory. You know, that's. It just gave me chill bumps, Rita. Yeah, me too. Me too, man. Uh, one of the things you briefly went over that I'd like to hear a little bit more about is when you did travel with The Who and Keith and what it was like on that bus. Uh, well, it was a private plane. And the oh. first time, <laughs> first time I you went couldn't out, throw anything out of that. First time I went out with them, they were. After the concert in Houston, they were arguing with the manager at Pete Townsend said he had gone, had somebody go out and check out the plane and he, they said it was a rickety plane. They didn't want to be on it. And the manager finally convinced him that it was okay. And it turns out it was the same plane that Leonard Skinner went down in. Exact same plane. Oh my God. And, um, that's crazy. It was just a true, you know, it was, it was like chaos because Keith Moon had the bedroom in the back. And I'm sitting next to Pete Townsend, a guy I idolized. And uh, it was pretty, pretty. they were pretty calm except for Keith Moon. He got made a, uh, stopping in Little Rock, dropped Sweet Sweet Connie off. She's a pretty famous groupie. Sweet Sweet Connie, what was yeah. it, Grand Funk Railroad? That's right. And yeah. she was in Memphis, but he wanted to stop in Little Rock. We were going to Atlanta. So the plane stops in Little Rock. That's how crazy it was. But, um, I saw Keith Moon fall off the stage in Boston after two songs. Oh, wow. I worked his solo album, which was one of the worst records I've ever heard in my life. At least you're honest. Two Sides of the Moon. He didn't, <laughs> I think NCA gave him about half a million dollars to do this album. He turned out to be a two day party for 48 hours. God. The record came, not surprising though. No, not surprising at all. 
working with the Who was um, especially Keith Moon. I mean, I love Townsend. I love all the guys. So actually, I went on the road with Roger Daltrey for two weeks, and he's like the biggest rock star I'd ever seen in my life. He um, went on a promotional tour for his uh, Ride of Rocky Horror. Right, right. And, and that was incredible. That was great. But um, Keith Moon, forget it, man. I'll bet you off of that guy. <laughs> Wow. Um, okay. Well, right now it's time for the bonus round. So we have a bunch of questions. We're going to throw at you real quick. See if you can answer them properly. Oh, Although we don't, we don't judge because we don't know the real answer. I got Elvis with me, so <laughs> <laughs> Elvis is on your side. Right. Uh, what was your first concert you went to? Dave Clark Five. Where was that Memphis. at? Nineteen sixty-five, maybe. Nice choice. What was your first album? Rolling Stone, uh, Beatles. Beatles' first album. No, actually, nice. yeah. no, I'm sorry. Elvis Presley. Oh, it was good. My first, my first album, because I was from Memphis. I was listening on the night that uh, Sam Phillips brought the record over to the DJ for the first time he played it. I was 10 years old, wow. and I was listening under my pillow, and I wasn't supposed to be doing that. And I heard, that's all right, Mama. Mm. And, and after that, I went out and bought the record. Nice choice. Yeah. Who would you want to meet that you've never met? Boy. Uh, probably John Lennon. Mm. Yeah, I would definitely say John Lennon. I mean, he was a great songwriter as well. But, uh, yeah, John Lennon. Okay. If you're making a documentary rock film, what subject would it be on? The way music is today and the way it was in the 60s and 70s. Because uh, a sad story. <laughs> me, <laughs> yeah, it's going to be, it's going to have a depressing ending. <laughs> To me, there's no, more, there's no more music business. I mean, I'm sure there's still promotion guys, but I mean, you gotta, you gotta, you can't call them. You gotta fax them or, or not fax them. <laughs> um, text them. Text them and or leave them a message. And, and that's, you know, that's not the way it was. It's all about relationships back in the sound. Yeah. I think that would be my documentary review. Okay. What was your worst rock experience? Meeting Keith Moon. <laughs> I went to his house. Did it did it ruin it for you? <laughs> no, no. Actually, I went to his house. We were going to do a. Um, we went around to radio stations on two sides of the moon. And our plan was to have this girl we uh, interviewed twenty girls to drop their pants for two sides of the moon. We went to radio. <laughs> Jeez, this is what the money went to, folks. Yeah. Just by the way, we went to the. We went to, I remember <laughs> going to radio records and photography was in on it. And he would go, one, two, three, four, and she'd turn around and drop her pants. And for two sides of the moon. And it made every freaking magazine there was. And um, but we actually called Universal Casting and asked for 20 girls to come up to our office and drop their pants. I think that would happen. Today. And I they don't said, think so. Yeah. <laughs> so a girl would walk in and go, hi, my name is Carol. And we had this little scorecard, me and Pete Gideon. We call it the ass scorecard. And uh, we were like, anyway, we, we found a girl on about the fifth person, but we wanted to see all 20, of course. You know, we had to do it. Of course. Of course. Research. You've got to do your job. That's one of the craziest things I've ever done. Research. Uh, what band do you regret never seeing live? The Beatles. Mm. Never saw them live. Never. And they played Memphis. They played Memphis, and that was, when the, that was right around the time. I was working in Lawrenceburg around the time of the first DJ job. And that's when they said we're bigger than Jesus. Oh, yeah. Okay. And people started bonfires in Memphis. <laughs> they were throwing their records into the uh, into a big pile. But I never saw the Beatles, and that would be something I would love to see. Yeah. Paul McCartney, but and I, and I love George Harrison. I never, mm. never saw him. Favorite Tom Petty album? Um, it's got to be uh, Full Moon Fever, I think, hmm. because MCA, believe it or not, hated that album. You're kidding. They told him to go back into the studio and record more songs because there, was, there were no hits on Full Moon Fever. And he played it for me. I'm going, this is one of the greatest things you've ever done. You know, I'm free falling and I won't back down. And, yeah. And running down a dream. Running down a yeah. dream. My God. And they go, you got to go back to the studio. Well, I happened to be a promotion man at MCA that I knew. I brought him over the next night to, to hear the record. And he flipped out like I did. And, he, and Tom said, well, we have a problem. The record company doesn't want to put it out. And he said, what? And he said, so he said, I'll take care of this tomorrow. So there was a big meeting at a conference room. 
all the executives were around, and somebody said, "Anybody else have anything to say?" And he got up on the, jumped up on the, on the table, the conference room table, started jumping up and down, said, "Who the fuck is saying there's no hits in four minute theaters?" He came out two weeks later because this guy, named John High, and um, can you believe that somebody told Tom Petty there's no hits in four minute theaters? Oh my god! Oh my god! Did they get fired? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I knew who was the president at the time, and I won't mention his name, but I think he quit not too long after. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. John, thank you so much for your time yeah. and for uh, what you did. Thank you for uh, saving Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers career and, and letting us all hear it because, I mean, what an awesome band. And I, my first uh, station was KZY, and I know that, you know, you took care of the, the guys down there, Jack. Snyder was the music director for a while and went up to KP yeah. and then uh, Larry Reisman also and and you always even looked out for them even so they were the little small station in Anaheim and thank well, you for letting me able to, to hear that that song on, on K West you know it was I mean life changing if Charlie, if Charlie hadn't have been there I don't know what I would have done uh, where can people get yeah. your book Tom Petty and Me well it's available on Amazon Amazon Kindle you can also buy it on my site which is Tom Petty and Me Dot com, and I sign every book. And if you buy it on TomPettyMe.com, there's a place where you can say autograph it to so and so. And I get so many people like after recent Father's Day, I can't believe you how many kids bought their book and said, "Can you sign this for my dad?" He turned me into Tom Petty when I was 11 years old. Oh. Tom Petty's music is so generational. It all will yes. be. He wrote songs that were short, meant something, and he'll never be forgotten. Yeah. Ever. No, absolutely. And thanks for being honest and true to yourself and your beliefs, John. Because all, all the years we worked with, which was way past the Tom Petty years, you know, when you got into your promotion and and marketing and travel and all of those kind of events, uh, it was always a pleasure to work with you and and your staff. It was both of you too. I mean, I, yeah, I, I respect you guys so much, Rita. And I always call Rita Rita be wild. Rita be wild. Thank you so much, John. Have a yeah. Thank you, Thank guys. You for yeah. The utmost respect for both of you. I gotta tell you, seriously, from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for everything. Thank Sizzling Memphis, John Scott. That's the nickname that Tom gave him. Yes, indeed. I hope that you folks enjoyed that. And what's great with the Petty Camp is they just have so much material. So uh, a new remastered edition of Wildflowers is coming out this month. Uh, you might want to check it out. It has all these extras and extras and extras. They just have amazing vaults. So uh, you might want to do yourself a favor and pick that up. It's really nice when you can go back and hear all those and additional songs that weren't released or different versions. And sometimes it's really cool different version. Special thanks today to John Scott for Zooming from his home. You can get John's book, Tom Petty and Me, My Rock and Roll Adventures with Tom Petty at TomPettyandMe.com. You can uh, follow John Scott. It's J-O-N on Facebook, John Scott. Instagram, John Paul Scott. And uh, make sure you go to our website, check out our show notes. There you can find some very interesting tidbits and videos and things that uh, our guests might have talked about that we've posted up there as additional fun information and fun stuff to look at. And a reminder, we are now on Amazon Music. We're also on iTunes. We're on Spotify and more. So wherever you listen, please rate us, subscribe, write a quick review. Only takes a couple minutes. And please share us with your friends uh, if you can. Because we know you have a lot of friends. And we have, I don't have any. I have, what, four or five maybe? How many do you have? I'm in isolation. So you, have, you only have cats. <laughs> I have cats. And they can't rate. <laughs> I can't even read. You know what? You got time now to teach them, so get on it. Because we could get two more reviews with your cats. <laughs> All right, Reese, give us that question again. Which Tom Petty song from Let Me Up, I've Had Enough album was co-written by Bob Dylan? I know the answer, but I didn't. I had to look it up. So I had no idea. answer we're looking for is Jamming Me. <sighs> Tom Love Pat, that song. Bob Dylan, Jamming Me. You're jamming me, man. <laughs> Please follow, like, and share us on Facebook and follow us on Instagram and Twitter. Please send notes. We are here all alone <laughs> on our little, and like you all are. Please send Rita a note. You can do it via our website. Maybe she'll respond to you and send you some happy, kind thoughts out there. 
we got some great shows coming up, so please keep listening, and uh, we will see everybody. We will talk to everybody in a couple of weeks. Take care. We will. We will talk to you.